Ever since science became bewitched by Einstein, the speed of light has been sacrosanct. Eddington, the Archbishop of Relativity, confirmed this in 1946 when he said, To vary the speed of light is self-contradictory. For many years, the meter was defined by a standard kept in Paris. In those days, the God-given standard of time, the orbital motion of the heavenly bodies, was accepted by just about everybody. And long before Einstein, scientists made measurements of the speed of light based on those two standards. At Pulkova Observatory in Russia, the astronomers measured it repeatedly with the same equipment, from about 1785 onwards. For more than 150 years, they measured a continually decreasing speed. Other scientists in Europe and America made measurements with various kinds of equipment. All showed that the speed of light was decreasing. A French scientist, M.E.J. Gouret de Bray, published a paper, The Velocity of Light in Nature, in 1931. He wrote, If the velocity of light is constant, how is it that invariably new determinations give values which are lower than the last one obtained? There are 22 coincidences in favour of a decrease in the velocity of light while there is not a single one against it. I believe that in any other field of inquiry, such a discrepancy between observation and theory would be felt intolerable. Why it is suffered in the present case is not apparent. It is, however, certain that if a decrease in the velocity of light were accepted on theoretical grounds, and if some misguided physicist attempted to demonstrate it is constant, the present observations would be called to witness to silence him conclusively. Gurry de Bray was one of the original scientists still committed to the scientific method, which demands that if observations show a hypothesis to be wrong, it must be abandoned. But he realised that science had changed. Theory, not observations, had become king. And only if the accepted theory predicted the change in the speed of light would the observations be taken seriously. The accepted and jealously cherished theory in vogue, Einstein's, demanded a constant speed of light. So mere observational evidence could be totally ignored. Professor Raymond T. Burge was known as the keeper of the constants. He published the most credible results for all the physical constants. His values were considered to be the most accurate and reliable available. His values for the speed of light showed a steady decrease. His values also show that other physical constants are also varying. Planck's constant seems to be increasing in step with the light speed's decrease, and the electron mass is increasing in a similar way. But Burge realised that if the speed of light is varying, then almost all of the constants of physics must be varying, because they are dependent on the speed of light. He saw that this would throw the whole of science on its head, and even though his own records of the values of the constants show that they are indeed varying, he wrote, It is the probable value of any given constant that changes, not its actual value. A belief in any significant variability of the constants of nature is fatal to the spirit of science as science is now understood. Oh, then why should anyone bother to do experiments? 
Experiments apparently can't give actual values. Those have apparently already been established by dictate, or consensus, or some kind of occult revelation, or the stipulation of Einstein's own free will. And since the whole of modern physics is based on Einstein's stipulations, modern physics would all fall apart if they were questioned. Burgess' outcry closed the matter, and further discussion of change in light speed was not tolerated. And to make sure that questioning the speed of light would not raise its ugly head again, the international unit of length, the meter, was defined as the distance travelled by a beam of light in a certain number of wavelengths of light. This guarantees that every measurement of the speed of light must, from that time onward to eternity, be the same. And this is doubly foolproof, because science now defines time in terms of the atomic clock, which varies with the speed of light. But for the last 20 or 30 years, physicists particularly astronomers and cosmologists, have been struggling to maintain belief in their theories because observations keep showing them to be wrong. And in several fields, physicists have realised that if the speed of light were not constant, then many of the anomalies facing them would be explainable, especially if the speed had originally been very much faster than today. One example is Joao Maguaja, a physics professor at Imperial College in London. When he first shared his ideas with other members of the faculty, he was criticised and belittled, and feelings were very strong that he should not waste his time on such an idea. It would not be accepted for publication and it would make the staff of Imperial College a laughingstock. But he continued with this research and found that other physicists, in fields ranging from particle physics to cosmology, were also working on variable speed of light theories. For the same reason, anomalies in their fields of research, which could be solved by a rapidly falling speed of light, early in the history of the universe. And several such papers have now been published, but it seems very unlikely that papers on the major consequences of changing light speed will ever be accepted by the establishment. Older reports on changing light speed and its consequences for the astronomical and geological timescales have faced vitriolic ridicule and rejection. One of the most fully researched of these reports, by Trevor Norman and Barry Setterfield, was published by Flinders University, Adelaide, in 1987, under the title The Atomic Constants, Light and Time. They examined the measurements from the 18th century till today, as well as implied values from observations much further back in history. They came to the conclusion that the speed of light has slowed down from a very high value to a point where it's now almost at equilibrium. In the same year, Professor V. S. Troitsky published a paper, Physical Constants and the Evolution of the Universe, in Astrophysics and Space Science. Troitsky concluded that the speed of light had fallen from an even higher value. Of course, with the present definition of the meter and the use of the atomic clock, all measurements now say the speed of light is constant. But Professor Thomas van Flanden compared observations of the Moon and Mars from 1955 to 1981 using both the original astronomical clock and the atomic clock. He wrote, 
the number of atomic seconds in an orbital interval is becoming fewer. Presumably, if the result has any generality to it, this means that atomic phenomena are slowing with respect to orbital phenomena. The obvious conclusion is that the speed of light is still changing when measured with the God-given standard of the movement of the heavenly bodies. And papers continue to be published by scientists like McGuager, who show that if the speed of light had originally been very high, then fatal flaws in current theories could be overcome. To make such ideas acceptable, these papers have to have the speed very high for a limited time. Then it must suddenly fall to today's accepted value. But there's a big problem with that. They can't account for the energy balance involved. The energy balance of the universe has to suddenly change drastically. That, of course, proves the sudden drop theory to be false. But that's not a big problem for science today. Theory, not observation, is king. And after all, the modern scientific establishment claims there's no such thing as truth anyway. It claims that science is only looking for useful theories, not truth. But even so, why is such an obviously fatal flaw ignored? If you accept that light has fallen by the kind of curve Setterfield and Norman's report deduced, you get a very good energy balance, but a very much condensed time scale for history, with atomic processes going on much quicker in the past and slowing smoothly to the present. Radiometric and astrochronological processes would have been initially very rapid, leading to a vastly shorter orbital time scale. History condenses to thousands of orbital clock years instead of billions of atomic clock years. No wonder Burge said a belief in any significant variability of the constants of nature is fatal to the spirit of science as science is now understood. Well, yes, that sort of timescale would wipe out much of current geology and demolish the theory of evolution, as well as a great deal of astronomy. And it might even help to explain why some high-profile scientists with very impressive credentials are admitting that science is now in a real mess. Let's look at that next time. Thank you for joining me for this episode. If you enjoyed it, please like, subscribe and press the bell so that you'll be notified as I release new movies. If you'd like to support this project, you're welcome to do so through Patreon. Find a link on my channel banner and in the description below.